Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. It's wonderful to be with you all. My name is Justin. I'm the pastor here at Aletheia Church. Uh, I love joining together, gathering together on Easter uh, because it's one of the two times a year I wear a jacket. So please don't get any false expectations. If you come back next week, okay, I will not be in this until Christmas. So consider yourself warned. But I love gathering on Easter Sunday. Uh, for, for Christians, Easter Sunday is the high point of celebration in the church calendar. I know everybody loves Christmas, but for Christians, Easter is like Christmas, Thanksgiving, birthdays, Halloween, maybe not Halloween, uh, you know, all these things rolled into one, a moment where we get to celebrate, because Easter is the entire reason that Christianity exists. So if you're in here and you're following Jesus, this is a time that where we get to really celebrate what it means to be a Christian. Now maybe you're in here just checking Christianity out. Easter is also a, the perfect time to join and to check out a church because on Easter, the thing we focus in on and the thing we preach about and sing about is at the very heart of the Christian faith, namely the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now today, we're going to be studying 1 Corinthians 15, so you can go ahead, turn there in your Bibles or in a Bible app if you've got it. This is one of the longest chapters in all the New Testament from the Apostle Paul, and it's all about resurrection. Now while you're turning there, I imagine in a room like this, there's a possibility of a couple of different reactions to the idea of resurrection. That dead people can get up from being dead to being alive again. And I'm not talking the zombie route. I'm talking like conscious people. Maybe you're in here and you accept that idea. You're like, yeah, I believe dead people can rise. Maybe you're in here and you're like, that's a strange idea. But I can be a Christian and I'm going to kind of just say, okay, I, that may or may not be true, but I'm going to focus in on some other stuff to do with Christianity. Or maybe you're in here and the idea you have about resurrection is like, that's weird. Dead people don't get up from being dead. That's kind of a silly idea. Whichever attitude you have towards resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15 is going to be the perfect reason or, or the perfect way that Paul is going to help us come to terms with it, because the people that he was writing it to had some of these very same attitudes toward resurrection. And Paul's going to show us just why the resurrection is really, 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 really good news. So 1 Corinthians 15, we're not going to read the whole thing, otherwise we'd be here uh, reading for 15 minutes, so I'll tell you when we're going to jump around verses. Follow along in your Bible if you've got them, or in the Bible app. We will also have the scripture up here on the screen. So I'll read, and then we'll pray, and we'll dive in. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, just a quick side note, that term there means both brothers and sisters, okay? Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Jump down to verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, 
We are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Jump all the way down to verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is God's word. Join me and let's pray and ask that he would guide us as we study it this morning. Heavenly Father, we come together and we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the foundation for our faith, the very pillars on which our hope stands. Heavenly Father, may we take this surprising news of resurrection and see just what it means for our lives today. May we hope and be encouraged by this really, really good news. Would you help us see the victory that you have won for us in Jesus Christ. Lead and guide us in your scriptures by your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. I love the summer. One of the reasons is that it's birthday time for my family and I. I have two kids. Both of them are summer babies. My son turns one uh, at the beginning of May, and then my daughter turns three. So this is a blast. My, My birthdays in April, then we have my son, then my daughter, skip a couple months, then my wife. It's a time of celebration. Now, I had a really good idea. I haven't told you about this yet, but I had a really, really good idea about a gift we could buy my son for his first birthday. We're going to take newspaper, crumple it up into a big ball, put it in a box, tape up the box, and give that to him. Because inevitably, here's what's going to happen. He's going to open the box, and he's going to take the gift inside, discard it, and he's going to be fascinated by this brown cardboard box. It's this universal quirk of kids to be more fascinated by the box than by the gift inside. And they have this ambivalent attitude towards the thing that we've spent the most money on, that we spent the most time researching. They're like, yeah, whatever, but this amazing box. Look, Dad, it's brown. It's incredible. Now, the Corinthians are treating resurrection kind of like the gift in the box. They're engaging in the Christian faith, and this this core part of the Christian teaching of resurrection They have this take-it-or-leave-it attitude towards it. And we we don't know exactly why, but I can imagine it's because resurrection is kind of a strange thing to believe in. Have you seen anybody who was dead five minutes ago be alive recently? Anybody seen that? No. It's not a thing that typically happens. So they become Christians, and they're like, resurrection, that's a bit strange, Okay, I'm going to just leave that to the side over here, and I'm going to do all the other Christian stuff, and I'll just leave that. And Paul writes this chapter to them, and he says, no, no, you don't get it. If there's no resurrection, there's no Christianity. You've opened the box and discarded the very thing that is really, really good news and is most valuable in this whole deal. And for us, we can't fall into the same trap that the Corinthians did. I know that resurrection is a real mental hurdle to believe in. But if we discard it, we are discarding the very thing that is most precious and most valuable in the Christian faith. Now, what is valuable about it, Paul tells us. He describes it as a great victory that Jesus Christ has won for us. This victory 
through resurrection is the gift, is what's most valuable. Now, before he tells us exactly why it's most valuable, he tells us why you can't separate out Christianity from the resurrection. And let me say it this way, that resurrection means final victory over the greatest enemy. Resurrection, the good news that we are celebrating today, means final victory over the greatest enemy. So why can't resurrection be separated out from Christianity? Look at where he started in verse 1. He says, I need to remind you of the gospel. The gospel is the foundation of the Christian faith. The word means good news. And he's reminding them that their faith is based not on an ideology or a philosophy or a moral code. It is based on news about an event that happened. And here's that event. He says in verse 3, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Really cool Bible geek side note. What we are about to read is likely the oldest portion of Scripture that we have. Paul is about to quote from a creed that was in circulation in the early church. Even skeptical scholars base these words to like within two, at the most, three years post Jesus' resurrection. This is cool. Paul's point, this goes back to the very foundation of what it means to be a Christian. Resurrection isn't this science fiction idea that developed 200 years after Christ. No. It says, I deliver to you the news that I also received. Here it is. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day. The event that is the foundation of Christianity is the event not just of Jesus' death, like a martyr, but it's of His death and His resurrection. And just if, if that weren't enough, Paul continues. He says, not only... Did you hear the news about him rising from the dead? It says that he appeared to Cephas, who is Peter, the apostle Peter, then to the twelve. Then, verse 6, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. This is amazing. It says you're treating resurrection like a myth, like a science fiction story. There are still people alive today who saw the risen Jesus. Go ask them. <laughs> Go ask them if you think you should mythologize the resurrection of Jesus. Paul says, you can't take uh, resurrection out of Christianity because it is at the core of what Christianity is. It's like one of three pillars that if you take that out, the whole thing, it, it collapses in on itself. But not only that, don't do away with it because it's true. It's a true story. People saw it. They're still alive. Go and ask them. Resurrection means final victory over the greatest enemy. And resurrection is not a myth. It is, in fact, a historical moment. And to be a Christian is not to buy into an ideology. It's not to live according to a moral code. Though there are certainly worldviews and morals that Christianity shapes. But it is, at its core, a life that is a response to this moment in history. So now that Paul has told us that you can't separate it out, he tells us why you would never want to. Why is the resurrection our final victory over the greatest enemy? So he picks this up in verse 12. He gives a logical sequence of ideas. And it's kind of redundant. I'm not sure if you caught that in the reading, but it's like, Paul, you're repeating yourself. If Christ is proclaimed as raised, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? If there's no resurrection, not even Christ is raised. If Christ is not raised, our preaching is in vain, because we testified about God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise. In fact, you, you get the point. He's being redundant for a reason. Here's His logic, okay? You Corinthians who are saying that resurrection isn't a thing, if resurrection is not a thing, well, then Christ can't have been raised. If resurrection is impossible for a dead person to rise from the dead, if that's impossible, which is what some of you Corinthians are saying, then Christ isn't raised. If Christ isn't raised, then this whole message, this preaching, this gospel, it's a sham. It's a lie. It's a myth. And then look at where he finally lands. He says, 
Those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Christians used to talk about death as sleep because of their belief in resurrection. But if it is in fact not sleep and they're not going to wake up, well, they have perished. And then in verse 19, if this is true, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. If resurrection is not a thing, Christ isn't raised, this whole message of the gospel is a sham, and we are a deluded, pitiable group of people. Because death is, in fact, your greatest enemy in this life. Paul's point, he says, those who have fallen asleep, those who have had a funeral and they're gone, they have, in fact, perished. A little bit later in this chapter, Paul calls death the last enemy. And I want to take a couple minutes to convince you that death is, in fact, the greatest enemy and your greatest enemy. You can think about this life kind of like enemies and saviors. In this life, you're going to pick something that you want to escape to a version of a preferable future. If in this life, your enemy is poverty, then wealth is the savior. If in this life, loneliness is the enemy, then that relationship or that person is the savior. If in this life, anonymity is the enemy, then notoriety is the savior. If in this life, unhappiness and misdirection is the enemy, then that career path is the savior. And the thought goes that, hey, if I get that thing, the money, if I get the status, if I get the notoriety, if I get the perfect relationship, then I'll leave all unhappiness behind me and it's all going to be sunshine and rainbows from here on out. And death stands on the sidelines and laughs. Because death gets the final say. He mocks even our best efforts to save ourselves. Even if you get victory over those lesser enemies, say you have the best possible outcome. You escape poverty and you become a multi-millionaire. What is your victory? Two, three decades of nice homes, nice cars, nice vacations? until you finally die. Say you get the greatest relationship in this life, the most beautiful, romantic, life-giving marriage. Oh, yes, awesome. You're both going to die. <laughs> Happy Easter, be encouraged. But uh, <laughs> it's true, right? You're both going to die. Death is the greatest enemy, whether you like it or not. And what death does is it kind of makes a mockery of our victories. The best thing we can hope for is a couple decades of health until our body finally deteriorates. A few decades of wealth, a few decades of enjoying friendship and relationship. And then finally death has its way and you die. Death is your greatest enemy. And resurrection means that Christ has won the the final victory over the greatest enemy. Now we know that death is the greatest enemy, but humor me a little bit more because I'm not sure it's dropped fully, okay? You need to live with a present realization that death is your greatest enemy because everything wants to normalize death. I'm not sure if you've read any of Richard Dawkins' books or anything like that, but there is this idealizing of death that it's a beautiful and natural part of life. That, that to say goodbye to people, it's, it's, you know, the Lion King song is coming to mind. It's the circle of life. I'm not going to sing it for the good of us all. But this past week, when both you and I watched the, the images of Notre Dame on fire, nobody clapped. Nobody stood there smiling. Nobody pointed at that and said, this is a good thing. It's the circle of life. This beautiful building, it's run its course, it's time to say goodbye. No, we all recognized immediately, inherently, this is a tragedy. It's no less a tragedy to stand at a graveside and a person far more beautiful than any built cathedral 
with far more meaning and worth, far more memories invested in this person. If they are dead and gone, if they have perished, that is no less a tragedy. In fact, it's far greater a tragedy than what we witnessed, than what we witnessed this past week. I need you to feel that. I need you to feel the weight of the kind of enemy that death is. And it's in light of this really bad news, sobering news, that the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ shines forth. Jesus has given us final victory through resurrection over the greatest enemy. Now, how has he done it? Verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised. When Jesus Christ rose from the grave that many years ago, on that Sunday morning, he broke all of our categories. No, no, wait, wait, wait. People live their lives and then they die. People who get killed, especially on a Roman torture device like a cross, those people stay dead, which is what everybody expected. Even though he had prophesied that he was going to rise again, nobody was waiting at the graveside, ready to clap and celebrate. Nobody expected him to rise from the dead. And when he did, he broke all of our categories. He was the one person... (laughs) who death couldn't laugh at. He was the one person who defeated that great enemy that none of us could ever defeat. Now, why is that good news for you and for me? Turn over the page. Verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We, we shall not all sleep, but we shall, change, we shall be changed. Back in verse 20, 20, what did it say? Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. If Jesus is the first fruits, who are the second fruits? If that's a phrase. Who are the second fruits? Us. So, we shall all be changed. Now this is really, gosh, if we had more time to talk about the nature of resurrection, what it means to put on this new recreated uh, flesh and blood. It would be amazing, but suffice to say, verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. Imperishable. In verse 53, this perishable body must put on the imperishable What is mortal must put on immortality. Do you know what the problem with these bodies are? Even the most functional ones, even the ones that are the most healthy, you know, the bodies that have ingested the most kale and whatnot, they just keep on dying. Right? No matter how much kale you eat, you know, how much Orange Theory fitness you go to, even the most functional bodies, they just... Keep on doing the same old thing, dying. But resurrection means that we, like Christ did, where he rose from the grave with this renewed, imperishable body, is exactly what's going to happen for us. The very thing that makes us susceptible to death is transformed and changed. Now, what's all this business about a trumpet? This, if you read the book of Revelation, this trumpet is this announcement of the return of Jesus Christ. That Jesus has come once to deal with sin through his death on the cross, then he ascended into heaven. Okay, so this is the gospel story. Jesus Christ rose from the dead, spent a short while with his disciples, then he ascended into heaven to sit down at the right hand of God. But the promise is for a return. And the dead, perishable bodies are raised to an imperishable nature at the return of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who has gone before us to make resurrection possible for us. And it's really, really good news because it means that the bodies we get at Jesus' return are no longer susceptible to death because they're imperishable and incorruptible. It is not, however, 
that we're going to live in his renewed kingdom always kind of dodging death and death is still going to be there. No, it is final victory because death is sent. Death is finally destroyed. When, this is verse 54, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on the immortal, then shall come to pass. So when this resurrection happens and we're given imperishable flesh and blood bodies, then shall come to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O death, uh, excuse me, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Now, how does that work? How does death itself die? Well, we're told in the very next verse, the sting of death is sin. When Jesus Christ returns, We're told that one of the main things he's going to do is that he is going to exile all sin and all causes of sin out of the renewed creation. The only reason that the great enemy of death exists in God's good world in the first place is because of sin. You remember way back when in the first chapters of Genesis? Death enters into God's good world for the first time when our first parents rebel against God And they sin against him. And because sin manifested in God's world, it swung the door wide open for death to enter in. But when Jesus Christ returns, he enacts the final victory because in sending all sources of sin and all sin out of the renewed creation, death is destroyed. Death is no more. And now the sting of death is gone. Do you know what the sting of death feels like? It's that feeling where you're sitting around the table with people you love at a family dinner, maybe even later today, and that little cloud comes over the room that says, you know this is only temporary. You know that in a, some kind of number of years, a few of these spots at this table are going to be empty. It's going to be different. The sting of death is that feeling that That pain inside when when children who are miscarried late, that that hollow feeling that if they've perished, if they're gone, what, what do I do with that? That's the sting of death. Death is the realization that you've been working maybe at this career for 30 years, building this business, and you know, that's probably not gonna last forever. That this work is going to eventually deteriorate. Somebody else is going to take it over and drive it into the ground. And the feeling of loss, that is the sting of death. The sting of death is the thing you feel walking around experiencing the temporary nature of this life. But thanks be to God. That's what Paul says. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ returns, all sin is exiled out of the new creation. And life without death is our new normal. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine living in God's renewed creation where the inevitability, the, the inevitability of death is not a reality that you have to live with? It's extraordinary. It's so hard for our minds to wrap themselves around that. I think the person who sums it up best, Samwise Gamgee in The Lord of the Rings. Really, though, no jokes. In The Return of the King, after he and Frodo are rescued from Mount Doom, look look at what he says. (laughs) And notice how the words line up with what we're studying. Gandalf, I thought you were dead, but then I thought I was dead. Is everything sad going to come untrue? What's happened to the world? A great shadow has departed, said Gandalf. And then he laughed, and the sound was like music or like water in a parched land. And as he listened, the thought came to Sam that he had not heard laughter, the pure sound of merriment, for days upon days without count. There's something about the promise of the renewed creation without death that taps into the very core of who we are. And I think if you're honest, you know that death is an aberration. Death is, in fact, an enemy. And the promise of resurrection is victory over the greatest enemy. 
This is not just a story about the future. This is as much a story that impacts the present. And Paul sums it up in one verse. Here's what he says, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Follow his logic here. He says, because you know that your life, is, that your life of following Jesus is not in vain, be steadfast and be immovable. Now, what do these words mean? Steadfast means to endure in difficulty. Get the picture of like a tree planted with its roots deep in the ground that even the worst storm can't blow it over. That's what, stead, that's what steadfast means. Now, when Paul says immovable, what is the thing that we would be moved from that he's saying you don't want to move away from that? And it's faithfulness to Jesus Christ. And here, I, I have one, one concise takeaway for you. How we can put this future reality into present practice. Choose loyalty to Jesus. Choose loyalty to Jesus. Why does Paul tell them to remain steadfast, to endure even when it gets difficult? Here's why. If you're a follower of Jesus... It's in the times that life is most difficult that it's most tempting to run after other saviors. It's in the times of life when things aren't going well that the promise of money to bring you satisfaction and salvation, you you might not use that term salvation, but that's what it is. The promise of money to bring you salvation. It's in the difficult times of life that that sounds really, really good. It's in the times of life when things aren't going well that to make your life all about career or all about status or all about a relationship and put the Jesus thing on the back burner, those are the times of life when it's most inviting. But you know what? It will fail you. Those promises are absolutely empty. Do you know how I know? Because 75% of the documentaries that you watch on Netflix confirm it. All the things we watch tell us time and time again that when people make their lives all about money or all about a career or all about a relationship, it fails them and they're crushed. You see the person who makes millions and yet still commits fraud. You see the person who was, who was searching after the perfect relationship and my life is going to be perfect when I find this person. Five years later, they're, they're separated. They're, they're done for. And they're moving on to, to the next people. You know that the promises of these false saviors are wrong. That's why Paul's words right now are so important. They're so important. Don't listen to the lies of false saviors because they are empty and they will always, always, always fail you. If you're in here and you are a follower of Jesus Christ, choose Jesus again and again and again. Even in the days of life where it's most difficult and challenging, When the promises of false saviors sound really enticing, choose Jesus as your victor. Choose Jesus as your victory. You know why? Because your your future is certain. You know how the story ends. You know that you get raised from the dead and are given an imperishable, incorruptible body to thrive and flourish in God's recreation, His new creation forever. Your labor in the Lord, difficult as it might be, is not in vain. Now, maybe you're in here and you wouldn't consider yourself a follower of Jesus. And you never considered the notion of resurrection before today. I want to encourage you, choose Jesus. Choose loyalty to Jesus. Every other thing that promises salvation will fail you. You know it. You know it. And yet so much of the real estate of our minds and our lives are taken up thinking about how we can get those things. Jesus is here today offering you true salvation, true victory. And not just over the greatest enemy. Here's the really good news. When you choose Jesus as your victory over death, you're invited to ask him for victory over the lesser enemies. 
Jesus tells us to pray, Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you know that is a prayer of saying, God, may the realities of the resurrection life of the new creation, may it rush backward into my present reality and heal this sickness and help help my money situation, heal my relationships. But those are for people who have the Spirit of God. So here's the, the deal. If you're just checking Christianity out and you're interested, but you're like, wow, I have a lot of questions to ask and a lot of hurdles to get over, here's my encouragement to you. Just come back next week. I can't tell you all the incredible ways that resurrection life spans out and can impact your life. I can't do it in 35 minutes. In one day out of the year, I can't. Come back next week. We're starting a new series. And it's going to be great. But maybe you're in here and this good news, you want this good news. You want to accept the invitation of resurrection. I want to give you an opportunity to do that. I want to invite everybody to bow their heads and close their, and close their eyes. And I want to ask you, if this good news of the gospel, the promise of resurrection and final victory, if that's something you do not have right, 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 right now, but you want, I just invite you to stick up your hand. Say, that's me. I want to accept the offer. I want to embrace the promise. I want to know Jesus and I want to choose him as my Lord and Savior. I'll just give you a few seconds to think about it, to reflect and to respond. This is such good news. (laughs) And what we're going to do is we're going to finish off our service in celebration. The promise of resurrection The promise of certain salvation is so good that it is worthy of singing and celebrating and raising our hands and singing till our voices go hoarse. So let's pray, and then we're going to sing together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the good news of resurrection. That the fact that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead means that we too will rise imperishable, incorruptible, to shine like lights in the kingdom of our Father. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Maybe they're going through a time in life right now where the promise of lesser saviors seems so enticing and they might be even an inch away from stepping away from you. I pray that you would grab them back. Show them that you are a good Savior, a loving God, a gracious Lord. God, I pray that, that, we would be, that we would be people who live out the resurrection day by day, who walk out this life in loyalty to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. For this good news, we live. For this good news, we sing. For this good news, we raise our hands and we celebrate. We thank you, God. We praise you, Jesus Christ. Amen. Go ahead and stand up with us, and we're going to sing of this good news of resurrection.